Are you looking for an easy way to run input shaping on your 3D printer? Follow along and I'll show you how to get that done automatically with these new accelerometers from Big Tree Tech. Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Patrick with Stacking Layers. So input shaping, what is that? Well, the easiest way to explain it is it's a function that takes measurements of your machine's wobbles, the way it moves around while it's printing, and it uses that information to perform a counter spell on all that wobbling, virtually eliminating the signs of ghosting. These lines here, as you can see, they're, they're radiating out away from the X, right? So as you can see, this is two of the exact same files printed at the exact same speeds. Um, this is, uh, both are printed at 100 millimeters per second um, on a bed slinger. So this is a little bit more than I would actually run this machine. Um, but here you go, you have with input shaping turned on, or sorry, turned off on this one, and this is the one with it turned on. That's the only difference between these. Is I turned it off, printed, turned it back on, and printed again. The exact same file, same speeds, everything. So it's a really nice uh, setup to, to have. Now, you can do that manually. There's ways of doing it, setting it up, where you print special models and you, you do sensors, uh, sorry, you do measurements and mathematics and whatnot to get it set up, and it works. It works really good. Um, but it's a little cumbersome and time consuming and you have to do it again and again if you're not getting a perfect measurement right away. But with these little guys, you can do that fully automatically for you. This was going to take the measurements and then use a script in, um, in Clipper to actually set it up, measure, find the best one that will meet your machine and allow you to basically just hit save and be done with it. So these little guys are great. Um, they plug in via USB, obviously you can see that it's USB-C. Um, they're running the Raspberry Pi uh, RP2040 chip for a for the host, basically. This is basically going to be set up as an MCU, which you see shortly. And then this little guy here is a sensor. So that here, there's two different ones, as you can see. B B Big Tree Tech has uh, made two versions of this, and I don't know exactly why, honestly. Um, this might be the, the more standard coming out soon. Um, this is the more traditional, which everybody is familiar with, called an ADXL345. Um, and so this is the one you normally hear about when people talk about doing uh, accelerometers or input shaping. Um, and basically that's the only difference between these two. So here is the new, the S2 is actually an LIS 2DW chip. That's that tiny little square right, right there. And then this is the ADXL 345. And that's that one right there, the bigger rectangle chip. And so that's the only difference between these two boards. So the setup is going to be identical. It's the same pins, same, Firmware needed, everything is identical. As you can see, the boards are, are virtual copies except for that one chip. That's all that's different between these two. So when it comes down to basically deciding which one are you going to buy, well, that's up to you. If you want to stick with the traditional ADXL 345, you can definitely do that. One reason why you would want to stick with this one or, or shop buy this one would be because if you have an older Clipper setup and you don't want to update to a newer firmware, um, the newer LIS 2DW was not introduced until a couple versions back. Um, so if you're running an older version of Clipper and, you know, there's really no reason to update if your machine's running perfect. So a lot of people like to just hang on to it and just leave it alone. So you would have to use this one because that it doesn't have the uh, the proper libraries to run this this sensor. So that would probably be the, the main reason why you would buy this over this. Also, the fact that this one, um, which I'll show you now, is more expensive at $15.99 normally normal price is 1845 this is the adxl but the s2 dw is only 10 bucks normally also 18 bucks so that's that's a big difference in price obviously and what's really strange is this newer sensor as you can see on this other chart here let's see which one is it this one here is more sensitive so this is the the first column here is the lis 2 dw the newer chip and the standard adxl right and so this one has a higher bit rate and a much finer sensitivity, as you can see the, the difference is there. It also has about half or I guess double the um, uh, resolution or whatever it would be. The, it, it's, it's more exact. So, you know, it, it's, it's still, it's both of them work perfect, honestly. Um, I've, I've messed with both of them and they don't seem to really have that big of an impact with what we're using them for. But for people running really hard, fast machines and things like that, it probably will benefit a little bit better to get a finer resolution in, in the detail. But um, yeah, so it's a lot less noise. It, it, basically, it's about twice as good when it comes to these numbers, um, but, but quite a bit more sensitive. So that's a benefit. And for that big of a price difference, I guess it's not huge, it's five bucks difference, but um, for that for that much of a price difference, why not just go with a newer one? 
you know, like I said, the only reason to go for the ADXL is if you're probably going to be using an older Clipper version. So that's that. So let's get into setting these things up. So here we are at the terminal. And first thing we're going to do is install some dependencies. And this is basically going to help uh, Clipper to know how to basically do the math and whatnot and talk with the sensors. Um, so what we need to do first is uh, get this section. I'll put this in the description, of course, a link to this. This is measuring uh, resonances from the Clipper documents. But it's these two things that we need to run here. Basically, all it's doing is checking. It's the APT update. So it's going to look for all the new versions of all these different libraries. And then it's going to say install these several different libraries. So you got NumPy and um, what is that? Math uh, plot and whatnot. So this is going to help to um, get those numbers and, and make uh, do what it does in the background. It's the easiest way. I'm not going to go into descriptions of the technical. It's really not important. Go ahead and the easiest way, just hit this little thing over here that copies it. And then you paste it in here with putty. You just hit a right click and it'll automatically paste it in and hit enter. And this is going to go through and run. It's going to check for everything and install what it needs to install. So I'll speed this up. Okay, now that that is done, um, as you can see, it says that I'm already at the newest versions. So, I mean, I already know because I've done this in the past. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. But it may, you know, say that you need to update. And there's one thing I want to point out. You might actually get where it stops and asks you if you want to, yes or no type of thing. Um, so go ahead, of course, and put yes or why and enter to do that. So I just want to point that out because if you are doing this for the very first time, and your system didn't come with this pre-installed, it will ask you if you want to update or it can ask you that. So just go ahead and hit yes. Um, and the same goes for this next step. So let's go back over to here. And we're going to, in, what we're going to do is install the uh, NumPy to the Clipper environment um, uh, library. So this is going to use pip, which is the Python install package, uh, package installer thing. And what it's going to do is actually going to install it because uh, Python, which is what Clipper uses and what is basically running in the background is set up in an environment. So it's not on, it's on the main, oh, too much explanation here, but it's uh, basically Python is running in two different areas or you can run it. So you have your main Python on your uh, computer and then you have also an environment. So this is the Clippy environment. So this is what Clipper runs in. Um, so it has to install what you just put in into that environment. That's what the second thing is. It's very important that you do that. Otherwise it won't work. Even though it is installed in Python, if you were to check it, it'll say NumPy is installed but it's not installed in the right environment. Okay, that's why you need to do the second thing. So it's again, simple, copy, paste, enter. It'll run through its installation. All right, as you can see, pretty quick and simple. Again, you may get an option asking, are you sure you want to install this or something along the lines of that? Um, just go ahead and say yes. Um, I can't remember if it actually does it with this portion or not, but if it asks, say yes. Also, I want to point out, you see these notices. Um, this is not an error. This is not telling you that it failed or anything like that. It's just letting you know that the um, the version of PIP, which is an installer thing, is a little bit older and that there's a newer version available. It's not required for you to update this in order for this to work. This is just letting you know that there is a new installer available. So later on, you can go ahead and run, run this command if you want to, to install it. That's up to you, but it's not important. Anyways. As long as you got this, it says that uh, requirements are satisf satisfied or that it was installed or anything like that, then you're good to go. Alrighty. So now the next step is going to be making the firmware for these little guys. And that's going to be very simple. What we're going to first do is uh, the ls command is going to list to see what's going on. Make sure you're in the right directory. You can also just do cd and enter and that will make sure you're in your home directory where you should be. Um, and then to make firmware, we want to first get into our clipper folder. Clipper directory to use the proper terms. Um, and so what we do is CD, that's change directory to Clipper, All right? Now we're in there and to make your firmware, it is as simple as typing in make, that's the make command. Make is a, a program basically that runs to make firmwares or other things, it's a compiler. And so you do make and menu config so we can set it up. Uh, there. Men make menu config, hit enter, and this is going to bring up our uh, Clipper um, yeah, firmware, what is it, configuration <laughs> for for the make. So this is, you know, if, you, if you've set up your original board, then you've probably already seen this and you know what's going on. So if you had never seen it before, it may look like something like this, um, pretty basic. 
I'll actually put it in to here. Typically, it's something like this when you first open it for the very first time. So if you see this, don't be alarmed if it looks different. Using the up and down arrows to navigate, um, you cannot use your mouse. Um, so you go to the very first one, hit space bar. That's going to enable. That's space bar is to select and unselect. Then you want to move to your microcontroller because we need to set up a different microcontroller. It is not the app mega. What is on this board is the Raspberry Pi RP2040. So hit uh, space bar there. And that's it because everything else is going to be default. All of this, you just leave it alone. We're using a USB interface, so you're good to go there. So you don't need to set up any special IDs or anything like that. Um, so once you get to this point, go ahead and hit Q for quit. It's going to ask you if you want to save. Of course, we're yes, we want to. And now we're done um, with setting it up. So now we have to actually compile what we just made. And to do that, um, it's as simple as typing in make. But first, I'd like to do make clean. Um, and this is really more important if you guys have done um, other other firmwares or if you've been messing around with it. This is just to give you a, uh, let's see, clean. This is just to give a, a clean folder to where the new compiled information is going to go. Um, it's not absolutely necessary, but what it does is it helps to clear out any folder. So if you had old binaries and stuff that was made from your, like when you, if you made your controller board for the printer, um, there's a, always a possibility that there's some relics or remnants left in that folder that can accidentally get put into the new firmware causing problems. So I always recommend do a make clean. Um, sometimes when you run it, yeah, you'll get this message here, the creating symbolic link. That's, that's fine too. If you see that, that's not an error. It's just letting you know that it's, it's set up this, um, this, um, directory for what we're going to be doing. It's, it's linked it. Symbolic link is basically like a, um, a shortcut in terms of if you're using windows, this is kind of the same idea. So anyways, to make it, all you do is type make and hit enter. And it's now going to compile the firmware for you. So this will take a little bit longer. Um, so I'll speed it up. Okay. Now that's done. Once you see that it's come back to the, um, the prompt where you can start typing stuff in all done. And the file that we're actually needing is this last one here, the Clipper UF2 file. That's the UF2 is the special file uh, format for uh, flashing to the R, uh, RP2040 chip. What we're going to first do now is um, connect to our uh, to our sensor here. So I'm going to be doing it for the new one, for the S2DW, just because it's the newer one. Um, but like I said, process is the same regardless of which one you use. So I have my uh, Pi here, or my CB1, um, and I'm that's plugged in regular, just standard USB. So I got my USB-C. So we need to connect it. But first, before you actually just plug it in, you want to hold down this little button here. This is the boot button. Um, so you hold it while you plug it in. Keep holding it and plug it in. And that's going to get it into boot mode. So once, once it's plugged in, you'll see a little light light up saying it's got power. And you just let go and you're fine. There's no confirmation, unfortunately, because we're not connected to anything with speakers. Maybe you are if you're using a Linux, Linux PC that has speakers and stuff like that. So you may hear some sort of, you know, like the Windows thing does the boot sound. Um, but yeah, there's no confirmation. So what we have to do is go back over to the screen, to the terminal here, and um, to query the USBs. So to query the USB, what we do is ls USB. That's going to be list the USBs connected. And now we can see in this list that we do actually have right here, the Raspberry Pi RP2 boot. Um, you want to make sure that that's in there. Um, you may see other things here. Like we, for instance, I have the, um, uh, the SKR, uh, what is that? The, the mini E3 connected also, because I wanted to show you basically this is like a working system. Um, so, but this is the one that that's important. This one's letting you know that you're ready to flash things, um, to the Raspberry Pi and to do that. It's a very simple command. What we're going back into make. Um, I do want to keep, I do want to point out, of course, this is all done in the Clipper folder. Don't come out of that Clipper folder. If some, for some reason you went out of that, go back into Clipper folder. So anyways, make, and then we're going to uh, flash. So we're telling make to, to flash something. And then in capitals, um, all capitals, we want to tell it the flash and oops, underscore. No, not underscore. Now I can't remember. Okay, but I think it's that one. Anyways, flash and device. And the device is going to equal, and you want to make it equal to this number here. That is the device ID. So make sure that it's that number. If it's a different number than what I have here, it should be this one, the 2E8A, 
0.0003. But if it's a different number, use whatever is with this boot. It shouldn't be different because I think that's something along with, the, with how this chip is. It's labeled that. Um, but like I said, if it is different, make sure to use whatever number is there for your RP2 boot because you don't want to flash it to something else like this down here. Um, so anyways, you highlight that is the easiest way and then right click and that'll automatically paste it down below. And let's see if I got the right. I can't remember now right off the top of my head if it's a, a dash or under underscore. But let's see. Hit enter. And yes, that was the right. Uh, nope, I was wrong. Flash underscore. I was right the first time. Don't doubt your brain. So let's get that right. Underscore like I had it the first time. And then enter. There you go. That's what you want to see. So it has gone through and found it. And it's done its um, commands that it needs to do to flash things out. And it did everything and reset. And you're good to go. It rebooted the device. Um, and let's, let's just do a USB uh, command. Now I'm pressing up and down if you guys don't know that. And that just goes back to what you've typed previously, sent out. Let's see, the USB. As you can see now, it's not in boot. It's just showing the standard um, RP2040. And this is what I want to show you that you see how it's a different number. That's why it's important that it says boot, that you're in the actual boot. And yet you're not using like just this one because that's not going to allow you to boot because you're not in the bootloader. So lots of boot sounds. <laughs> but basically the difference is that it, you're in different parts or different part uh, partitions of that chip. So when it's in boot mode, it actually looks like it's a uh, USB, which you'll see a little bit later. Anyways, enough of that. So now that we got that flashed, what we need to do is get the serial number that we're going to use in the setup of this thing for the, uh, the printer config. And to do that, it's the standard uh, ls command for list. Oops, not capitals. Let's get that out of there. ls. And we want to do forward slash and dev and then serial and then by dash id. And this is going to look for things um, in this directory setup. So this going deeper into directories and looking for the ID. Now I like to put a little star because what that's going to do is it's going to list everything that's in there. It'll list everything anyways, but it's going to list it, including this part. Um, and I like doing that just because it makes it easier to copy because you want to copy from this forward, um, forward slash all the way to the end of the ID here. I'll just hit enter so you can see what I'm talking about. So you see it came up with two of them because I have the um, SKR mini. It's connected, so it's showing you two. So I want to show you that there's a possibility you'll get several of them. Um, so you want to make sure to look for the USB Clipper RP2040. Let's say, for example, you have two Raspberry Pis. You have something else that already has one of these chips on it, so you have two of them. You don't know which serial number it is. It's very simple. Obviously, you just unplug, run the command again, and now you see there's only one. So take note of you know something, a unique number inside here that's going to say which one it is. Plug in your new sensor again, uh, run that command again, and now you can see the other one showed up. So that's obviously the one. So for what we need um, to set up the serial in printer config is this entire line to there from the front of the forward slash dev all the way to the end there, not the rest of this. Obviously, that's the second board. Um, so go ahead and copy and put that in a safe spot, put it like on a notepad or something like that. So we're going to do uh, control and shift and C if you're using putty, that'll do copy without without duplicating it um, or use whatever copy you want. But put this in a safe spot because that's your, that's your serial number that you need to enter later for the printer config, which we are going to set up now. But before we do that, I want to give a huge shout out to our video sponsor, PCB Way, for helping me out and making this channel grow. And so let's watch a little commercial on that and we'll be right back. If you're someone who loves tinkering, designing and creating, you'll definitely want to check out PCB Way. PCB Way isn't just about PCB manufacturing. They've got a wide range of services to cater to creators just like you. From crafting intricate prototypes using many forms of 3D printing to precision machine parts through CNC machining and so much more, PCB Way has got you covered. A really nice part is their online coding system. It lets you see the cost estimates for the services you need, allowing you to plan your projects without any surprises. As for quality, PCB Way takes it seriously across all their services and do their best to ensure all your designs will meet the highest standards. Beyond services, PCB Way offers a supportive community. 
Their forums and dedicated support team are there to help you to navigate through your creative journey. If you're intrigued and want to know more about PCB Way services and how they can benefit your projects, check out the link in the description. I want to give a big thanks to PCB Way for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the video. Okay, we're back. Let's get this printer configuration set up. So what we need to do is obviously go into our uh, main cell or whatever you're using, main cell uh, fluid. And you want to set up a new file to put your um, information and <laughs> set up your, your configuration. So I like to do it in a very specific way. I like to add a file and I'm going to label this one LIS2DW and make sure to dot CFG as for config. I like to do it this way because it keeps things a little bit more tidy. Um, and if I want to change things later, I don't have to go and search for it in the printer config and it keeps the printer config file a lot uh, cleaner. Um, in my previous video, I made a, a little video about, I guess not little, a <laughs> long video about uh, what the printer config file is. So that's what I talk about when I say keeping things organized and simple. Um, this is one of the methods of doing that. So anyways, so open up the file that you just made. It's either going to be ls2dw.cfg or adxl345. You can name it whatever you want. If you just want to name it accelerometer or inputter or whatever you want to name it, Bob, that works too. Um, this is just the file, but it's important to know which one is a obviously connected to that sensor. And what we need to put in here is the configuration for that. Um, again, I like to make these things as easy as possible for you, so I'll leave links to these. Um, this is the pre-configured um, uh, uh, configuration <laughs> for this. They, they call it sample Big Tree Tech LSI, yeah, so on. Um, this is on Big Tree Tech's GitHub page. They pretty much have everything about all their stuff on their page. But I'll put a link there. So you want to come up to these little squares, copy this. It's going to copy everything inside here. And then all you have to do is come back to that file and paste it in. And you're pretty much done with that. Um, there is one important thing to uh, keep note of. Um, well, first off is obviously this number here. That's why I tell you you need to copy that serial number. Um, that is obviously, let's go back since I didn't do that copy. So highlight this copy and replace that there because if you leave whatever is in there it's not the unique number for your chip so it's, it won't be able to communicate to that so that is just a place holder whatever is in there and this goes for pretty much any sample configuration if you were not aware any of those sample configurations that have a serial already in it that's just a placeholder do not trust that that's going to work for your system so that's important um, another important thing is down here the access mapping this is telling um, Clipper when it runs its setup what direction um, the sensor is because they have it's a it's a three dimensional sensing system so it obviously has an X Y Z sensor and normally it is in a format of um, or, or what it assumes it's in is X Y and Z so that is the standard positioning of everything. So this right here is the X position. This is the Y position and Z position. The reason why there's like a negative Y and X and negative Z is because it depends on how the sensor is oriented to what the actual access is. So this would be your printer. And then this is the sensor direction. Now let's go over to the sensors and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'll just I'll go ahead and unplug this. So here on this one, uh, you can actually see, let's see if it'll zoom in on that. Will it? Here, maybe I can just do an actual zoom, zoom. There we go. All right, so as you can see here, if I can point on it, you have that little X and Y, those, those arrows, right? And then there's a circle in the middle. The circle is the Z, and it's basically, it's like an arrow pointing up at you, so it's facing the camera. And that's the orientation of that square sensor. So the Z in a positive direction is facing the camera, Y is going this way and X is that way. So and if you, as you see, if you were to lay this flat on your printer bed, that would be a proper way that your printer goes, right? So you have your X is, is left to right, Y is forward and back, and Z is up and down. But if you install the sensor, say for instance, this way, and it's hanging on the side, well now, let's see if I can get some better light on here. So now you have um, X, say for instance in the z positions if it's this is going up and down and the x is pointed negatively in the z direction so x negative on the sensor is z positive 
right? And so y positive is on now on the x positive, and z positive is on the y negative. Does that make sense? Um, same thing here. If you lay it flat on your bed, now the x, the z is in the proper spot, up and down, so it's positive z, but your y is now in the positive of x, and the x is in the um, negative of y. And I'll show you how that relates to on the thing. So it's all about how the sensor is going to be moving is what you're telling Clipper in this position here. So let's go back to that. So here, I'm going to be installing the sensor in an up and down direction with the USB facing up. So what that's going to mean is that my Y, or the, the X position of my printer, the way it's moving, so this is telling you, so when the printer goes left and right, I'm going to tell it, what is the sensor going to do? So the sensor is going to actually do a positive Y. So I'm going to leave it that way. So the arrow is pointing to the right on the sensor for Y axis, but my machine is going to be moving to the right on the X axis. Is that making sense? So the next one is going to be for the Y position, because this originally on the machine is Y, exact, right? But the way it's going to be moving for Y is actually the Z, and it's going to be moving in the negative. So when Y, the machine Y goes positive, the sensor is going to, is going to feel like it's moving in the Z axis negatively. Okay. This is important because it helps to get the sensor, um, uh, the information you get from the sensor, it makes it tell Clipper exactly where it is. And the last one, the Z position is on my X and on the sensor, the X thinks that positive is down X. But when the Z obviously goes up, then um, that's the sensor is going to be in the negative of the X. That one I don't really think is actually important because we're not shaking in the Z position. We're only shaking in the X and Y positions. Um, but I just put them there regardless. Um, but these are important to do. Make sure that you map these out exactly the way it's sitting on your sensor. So remember, this is always going to be the X position of your printer. So you're saying when the first position, when the X moves in a positive direction, what is the sensor doing? Like I said, mine is moving the sensor in the Y direction and so on. If you don't understand that or if it's a little confusing, definitely leave comments down below. Um, I will again show you when I get this um, in, in action, when we're going to actually run the test. I'll show you how it's sitting on the machine so you can see what that's working. But I just want to point out because that's probably one of the biggest things that some people have issues with. Um, others say that it actually doesn't matter. I I don't find how that is, but um, if you're running, like what I'm going to do, I'm running on a bed slinger. So I'm going to be doing the X axis alone um, and then the Y axis. But if, maybe if you're on a core XY, it's not as important because it's shaking the whole thing in all of its own way or all, all at the same time. But with the bed slinger, you're doing individual axis alone. So if you move the sensor, so for instance, I'm going to be using the same setup and I'm going to move the sensor down to the bed to run the bed test separately. Now, when I move the sensor, obviously I'm moving the orientation, so I'll have to go back in here and redo that. Um, another option, if you're doing it that way, you can actually set up another um, part. So you can have this as, um, as for instance, uh, hot, hot end, for instance, or uh, and another one set up as bed, and then you can just toggle between the two, so you can save um, all of this information for each. That's more used when you're using two different sensors. So if you have one that's permanently on um, your print head and then a separate one on the bed, two different sensors, you would set them up separately. Which one is the bed? Which one is the hot end? Since I'm using the same, I'm just going to run a command, which you'll see shortly, that is going to be saying only test the Y position, only test the X position. So that's that. Um, this part here, the resonance ten ten tester, um, is uh, you could just leave it the way it is. But if you want, um, they say to run it in the center of your bed. Um, and as close to the, to the build plate as possible. Um, I think again, that's more important for, uh, for machines like for core X, Y's if they're on a different type of gantry system, but, um, just, just do it. So I'll just even, I'll just put this to 10. So that's 10 millimeters in the Z, um, 10 millimeters above the X axis. And then this is going to be in, uh, sorry, above the, the bed. Um, and then your first one is X and your second one is Y just as normal. And then saying it's going to be a hundred and hundred. So it's not dead center on my bed, but my bed has, it's kind of irrelevant to the way that it's going to be shaking 
the, the printhead. So anyways, that's that. <clears throat> then, uh, yeah, this was telling you which chip it is. So just quick breakdown. You have the MCU, which is the, um, the actual chip that we're using that's controlling the sensor. That's what we're plugging in here and setting up. And you're saying what kind of, uh, or, sorry, it's an MCU, and this is the name of the MCU. This is the serial, so Clipper knows who to talk to. Then it's telling what kind of sensor are you using. So this one is the LS2DW. If you have the ADXL, instead of LS2DW, um, you will have, uh, which I'll have, of course, again, in the description. Um, so you'll have something like um, this ADXL, where's the XXO, and then the 345. Okay. So you have it set up like that. That's the difference. So you're just telling which one, um, which sensor it is. So Clipper knows which background uh, program to use to run that sensor. So that is important. I will again have both in the description. Um, this name here is not as important, um, but it's always good practice to just label it the same as whatever it is. That, that way it's not confusing. Um, I'm gonna keep zooming in now. Sorry about that. Let's reset that. Um, but the uh, the important part is whatever name you use, so it's after the space, after MCU, whatever this entire name you use, you do need to use that name in all these, see where they're all highlighting each other? Because that has to match to the MCU. You're saying um, this is the chip select pin, so this tells the, um, yeah, how to talk to the sensor. And it's saying use the pin that's on this MCU, which is called that, and the pin number is that. That's why you have these sometimes where you have the full thing. Now, if this is in your printer config and you're using something that's, I don't know what it would be, but I guess if you're using a, the, the SPI that's on your board, you're using like the old school style accelerometer and you're using the same board as your, your standard MCU that doesn't have a name, then you would have without this, you would have only the GPI or whatever the, the pin number that's attached to. Otherwise, if you're using these other things where they have a second, second board that you set up firmware to and, and have this whole new serial number, you must use the name of whatever it is and the colon. Okay, so that's it for the setup of the printer, sorry, of this configuration. Now we do have to set up printer config to talk to it. So go ahead and just hit save and close, don't restart yet. So you save and close and it'll go back out. And then we go to our printer config. Um, and I've already set this up, but what you wanna do, let's get this out. You wanna do include, so you do the brackets and then in there, you. Uh, include is saying include the configuration file that we just made. So include space and then whatever you named that configuration file it goes there. Then the next step we need is input shaper. This can be honestly put down below further if you don't want it at the very top. I just put here easy viewing. Um, but this is telling you um, that you want to use input shaper and um, it gives some placeholders that these numbers right now are not important because we're going to run an automatic test. But you do have to have something here for Clipper to see. Otherwise, it's going to give an error that something's missing or that's not working. So you, you set up this is saying, I want to use Input Shaper. And then these are the different um, values that Input Shaper is going to be able to use. Um, so once you have that, make sure your sensor is plugged in, obviously. So it will work. We can go ahead and hit Save and Restart. And it should, if everything went right, it should reboot. There we go. And now you see you have the LIS2DW or your ADXL connected. So this is the new one that we set up. And of course the original board there. Um, we can confirm that it's working. So if we go into console and we do, uh, what is it? Resonance tester? Uh, let me double check that. There's a a separate thing just to query it. Something like accelerometer query or something like that. I always forget these comments. I, I tell you, using the documents is probably the best thing that you can do. Always go through. Yeah, it was accelerometer query. That's the comment you need. Documents have pretty much everything you need. It is confusing, and as you start reading through them, it starts probably getting a little, you know, kind of off-putting. <laughs> When you first look at them, if you don't know what you're looking for, but really everything's there to take your time to read through. Um, but what we're doing now is just going to check, make sure the sensor is talking. And there you go. That confirms that everything is going. These numbers are kind of irrelevant, but it's just the uh, the G-force that's on there um, at the moment or however that exactly works. Um, but if I move the sensor, say I'll flip the sensor up now, run the command again. 
And as you can see, the numbers have changed. So that's good. So the sensor's reading, everything's good. Now what you need to do is install it onto your machine. That's up to you how you're gonna be installing it on the machine. So speaking of installing, so what Big Tree Tech has done here is really nice. They have um, these two standard small holes and those are designed for pretty much a standard setup anywhere. A lot of machines that use the older accelerometers will fit these because it's, it's kind of an industry setup. Um, but then they've also added this larger hole. Um, and the reason why they've done that is because it's best to get a reading as close as possible to the nozzle or to the print area um, that you're going to be using on, on the most average. Obviously, your nozzle is the closest to the print because that's where it comes out, the material comes out. Um, so you can use the provided um, silicone spacers in an M6 bolt. Take out your nozzle and then put that in. I'm not going to be using that because I actually I have the, um, uh, what is it called? The uh, H2 uh, VS2 light or V2S light. And so it's a, it's a four millimeter nozzle. So it's a little bit of special thread. So I can't use that. Um, I guess I could take the nozzle out and use the nozzle, but I'm not going to go through all that. I'm just going to attach it this way. Um, but yeah, it's a nice thing to do. If, if you can, if it's easy for you, you go ahead and use the nozzle. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Of course, these are not designed to be on the machine while printing. These are designed to be installed, uh, set up to uh, take the measurements, and then removed. If you're using these side bolts, for instance, um, you can leave it on the machine. If it's not you know, hindering any type of motion, it's fine. Um, obviously, though, if it's on the nozzle, we're not printing with this on. The, the heat will mess up this. Don't do that. I um, just wanted to point that out because it's not designed to be permanently on the machine using the nozzle. Okay. So let's get this installed on the machine. I'll show you a quick little test. And uh, okay, so here I have it set up on the uh, H2 extruder. So as you can see there, I have mounted it with those two screws and you can see the little red pieces in the, in the back here. I, I put spacers, make sure if you're mounting this to something like this, put spacers behind there. You don't wanna have all the circuitry in the background butted up, especially with this, this is metal, obviously that'll short things out. So make sure to take note of that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so as you can see what I was talking about with those orientation, um, the way things are, see the little arrows, how they're pointed. So make sure that your mapping is correct. Okay. So that's it with that, with the installation. That's pretty simple. It's plugged in, obviously, USB to the machine. Uh, let's get this camera set so it's not wobbling all over the place. Sorry for all that motion. Hopefully that stays there. Okay. And then back over to the machine, as you see, I'm logged into my Huracan printer that, that the sensor is on. And uh, I always like to just uh, do, the, do the query first, just to make sure. Um, just make sure that the sensor is up and running. So it is. And then what we want to do is um, the input shaper um, automatic command. And there's different ones if you read through this documentation here. Oops. Um, there's different ways of doing it. So you can just test it and make sure it's working, which is fine. You can do the real life test um, and it'll give you information and stuff, but that's kind of a manual way, right? So we want to go further down. Um, oh yeah, quick note since I'm passing it. These are those charts I'm talking about. So it takes all that information with the NumPy and stuff, those inst things we installed and it makes these charts. There is an extra step to do. Um, I'm not going to go over that with this specific, excuse me, specific one, but there's these commands you run to actually generate these charts. Um, I'm not going to go over that because honestly, I mean, it can help you to see if you have weird things happening to your machine, but I don't know how to read these well enough to give a good explanation. So I don't want to go over it, but you'll see a lot of people comparing these charts. Um, just know that you can use this command right here to, uh, to, um, basically make them, it'll make a picture that you can download from your thing. So, um, anyways, that's that. But the thing that we're doing is automatic here, right? So let's see, we want to go down. Down, down, down. Uh, there we go. To the input shaper auto calibration. And it's a very simple command. It's just shaper calibrate. But because I'm doing it on this, this would be used on a core XY system. But because I'm doing it on a, just on the X, we want to do something like this, um, which says only on this X axis. So it's obviously this one says Y, but we're going to do it on X right now. So go ahead and copy that. Um, go over to your printer. I want to make sure, like I said, I'm running on the X. And as you can see, once I hit enter, you will see the machine do a thing. Actually, first, wait, I'm wrong. You need to home it first. Always home before running this uh, command. Uh, so that's a G28 to home.
And then now we can run our test. There it goes, puts it in the position we do. And as you can see, it starts shaking the system. And it's going to shake the heck out of your system. So as you're back over here on the screen, you can see that it's running through several increments of, of different um, hertz. And it's, it, the frequency is actually steadily rising up. And you'll be able to hear your machine, depending on how your machine's mounted to your desk or however, you'll start hearing these the frequencies once they get into the audible range. Um, I don't know, I, I kind of geek out about it. I think it's really fun to hear. Um, but we're going to let this run through. I'll speed this part up because it could take a little while, and then we'll get back to it. Okay, so now that's all done. And as you can see, it printed out a whole bunch of uh, different options, basically. It's showing you all the different types of smoothing styles. Um, these are just different ways that it'll it'll do its thing. <laughs> um, and uh, these are the different frequencies that go along with it. So what they're saying here, obviously, if, you, if you're going to choose to use the EI um, shaping, then you'll want to set it to a frequency of this, for instance. Um, it's also showing to avoid too much smoothing. Smoothing is where like the corners and things start getting really rounded. They, they lose their, um, their sharpness. Um, you want to keep your acceleration at a certain uh, max, basically. Keep it below whatever the number is there. And I do want to point out, I am doing it again on a bed slinger. So that means my X, which it did just now, is capable of having a much higher acceleration because it's just, you know, it's just moving the hot end. But because of the fact that it is a bed slinger, the bed is going to actually cause um, this number to be a lot smaller. So if you're using a bed slinger, do not use the, um, the, the max acceleration for the X axis. Use whatever is said for the Y because you can't, you can't have two different accelerations on it because obviously it's moving in unison. The X and Y move as a unit. Um, so you don't want to put the X because that, that's going to cause skip steps. If, you, if I were to put 8,400 8, millimeters per second on, on this machine, the motors are not going to be able to throw that bed around. The bed is too heavy, and that is your limiting factor on the um, the bed slinger printer. So I wanted to point that out um, because you know you see this like oh yes now I can accelerate I can get this thing moving really fast. But if it's a bed slinger, that big aluminum plate being slung back and forth is going to cause missteps. Guarantee you, um, unless you know maybe you have some really heavy motors that you've installed and things like that that can handle it. So that's good. But for a stock setup, run the this um, you know, the, the input shaper on the Y axis and use that as your maximum acceleration for the machine. Okay. That'll, that'll cause, or that'll help you, uh, uh, stay away from a big headache and why your machine keeps missing steps or, you know, <laughs> having issues. Okay. Another thing I want to point out while it's running this, while you're going through the test frequencies, this is another kind of a side effect, um, that kind of help you is you will probably, depending on how your machine is, you know, screwed together and whatnot, you might start hearing things rattling and moving around. Do not touch the machine while it's running through these frequencies because you'll actually upset the natural resonant frequency that it's, that's looking for. Um, so just leave it alone. Don't go searching for it. Let the machine rattle and just kind of take an audible, audible notes of where things are. Um, so you can later go on and check and make sure the screws aren't loose somewhere or something like that, okay? Um, but it's, it's a good way to find loose screws. So you'll be able to hear things starting to shake around and make a lot of noise. That's letting you know where things are loose. But like I said, don't touch it while it's actually running the test. Otherwise, you will get um, improper feedback. It's not going to give you good numbers here. Okay. Once that is done, you see at the very top here, it says the save command, um, save config command will update the printer. So you run this, it's going to reboot your system and save this. Um, so we'll just go ahead and, and copy that and put it there. And this will restart the machine. And once that's all booted back up, then um, you're good to go with that. Um, now, just to confirm, you can always check. Um, I'll show you something that I actually will do here. In the printer config, when you do that save uh, config command, uh, mine's a little bit different now. I don't have that up here at the top anymore. Um, but let's go down to the bottom where I have the input shaper. Where is it? Okay, here. So here I have the input shaper. And what it will do is it'll actually comment out automatically what you had here. And that's why I say you need to have that originally because it's going to comment that out. And then as you see a little bit lower under this save config area, it creates this automatically. And now it's using this. I know it looks like it's commented out, 
but this is a special area that's that used uh, is used for the save config option. So anytime you do things like here, I use also for probe offset, right? Um, so anything that you're going to do a save config command needs to be in the printer config file, just to kind of point that out. But these are the new numbers. So this is what it recommended to do. And then, uh, yeah, everything should be good and ready to go. So once you come to that point, actually, you're, you're pretty much done. Um, when you move your sensor, I do want to point out, especially when you take it off the machine, you're not connected. You want to come back up to the include part. This is another reason why I like making a separate file. Um, so you just come to the include and then put a, a um, hashtag in front of that to comment that out. And that'll turn off the sensor. It's that simple. So you don't get any errors about the MCU missing and things like that, any connection errors. Um, so yeah, just comment that out and that's turning the sensor off and on right there. Um, and then you hit save and restart and everything will go back to um, just the printer alone without that sensor attached. So you can go ahead and unplug it, remove it from the machine and be good with it. And once you've done that, everything is done. You're set, ready to go, and your machine is set up to run Input Shaper. That's, it's that easy. So hopefully you like that. Um, I do want to say a big thank you again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. It's a massive help. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you guys have any questions or uh, um, want to see more about that, follow the link in the description to their website. Lots of cool stuff there. Um, really cool people to deal with also. Um, also, as a little bonus, since you've made it to the complete end of this video, I want to point out the very bottom of my um, description is going to be a link to a GitHub page where I have made a file. I know this kind of defeats the whole purpose of my video, but I've made a, uh, a script that basically does all of this automatically for you. Um, now, I do want to point out, of course, this is my first time ever writing a script like this, so I cannot guarantee that it's not buggy. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there's always a chance. Make a backup of all your configuration files before you run it, if you choose to do it. Um, but I've tested it on my machine, and I've tested it on a couple different sensors now, um, on two different Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi and a uh, Beat Victory Tech thing. So it seems to be working perfectly. But like I said, back up your configuration files just in case you have to redo things, okay? Um, don't, I'm not going to be held accountable if something like that messes up, but it shouldn't. Anyways, go ahead and look down at the very bottom of the description for that link um, to my, it's called the Excel Flasher is what I've named it. Um, if, you, if you're curious and want to try it out, um, let me know. Give me feedback if you did try that. Put it in the comments. Say, you know, I tried Excel Flasher and let me know if it worked or not. Um, I would really like to know if it did and how that worked out for people because it's something I think would be really helpful um, for the, you know, for the community. Anyway, so that's that. Um, again, thank you for watching the video. Hopefully this was helpful. Any questions down in the comments, um, that, you know, just, just ask away. Um, anybody else, if you guys are in, you know, looking at these and you've done this type of stuff before, but you're reading through the comments, um, I'm getting more and more questions, stuff like that. But if anybody else wants to jump in and ans answer questions, if you know the answer or just kind of, you know, go in with the conversation, I, I welcome it. Um, I, I would actually appreciate it if other people like to jump in and have some good conversations going on. It makes the comments look good. Um, <laughs> and I like to see what people talk about. It always, you know, helps me get new ideas and things too. So um, let me know about that stuff. Anyways, again, thank you for watching. And until next time, happy printing.